patriotism is normal and natural for ordinary human beings because territoriality is something which humans as a species has the characteristic whereas nationalism is not territoriality of that kind nationalism is an ideology and ideology not only tells you what the patriotism does but it also tells tells you who your enemy will be and who your ally will be. Uh, we know that you have psychoanalyzed the nation and as part of uh, uh, that whole process of becoming a psychoanalyst i'm sure at some point of time you must have also psychoanalyzed yourself mm -hmm. so what would be your own psychoanalytical account it would be difficult but i will try and i have tried it now that i've started i might uh, tell you that there was a book in bengali unfortunately of my dialogue with a psychoanalyst jayanti wo pasu and there i have come with my best effort to spell out how much my work has uh, been influenced or shaped for that matter by my personal life that i think is the closest i have come to trying to explain it and it is perhaps the only book in bengali where this effort has been made by a serious author talking seriously about <laughs> his involvement in different kinds of intellectual exercises hmm. so let us see may i request you to go back in time to uh, bhagalpur bihar hmm. where you were born hmm. and your childhood hmm. and if you can give us some reflection of that childhood in that where in bhagalpur hmm. how was the time the bhagalpur had a um, large presence of bengali at that time it was not seen as an another state part of it, it first of all uh, my uncles stayed there two of them stayed nearby bhagalpur they stayed in bhagalpur but practiced around a much larger area uh, both were doctors and uh, it it was my privilege to once in a while go there because my mother would go there uh, to meet her mother and uh, taking us with her and therefore we were exposed to the culture of bhagalpur mm. and uh, my uncles knew some of the bengali writers sarachandra chattopadhyay was already dead but uh, bolai mukaji uh, or better known as bonafu i have why remembering his correct name was still there yeah, and my uncles knew him also there was a large bengali community which we interacted mm. and in some sense we had a lovely time because we went there on our holidays and we had a number of cousins who were very interesting company and i kept in touch with them for very many years now unfortunately many of them are dead ones older than me are of course naturally dead but some of the younger ones are there but i have more or less lost touch with most of them i do get their news once in a while from one of them passes by or who calls me mm. uh, but that is a regular affair also mm. in many ways it was an escape from calcutta was business of ganges from the house one of my uncles had a house beautiful house right on the bank of ganges where was in bhagalpur um there was a, a place where a lot of bengali stayed i think it was called bangali tola or something okay like bangali tola there was also another house another uncle had that was in right in the center of the city mm. um, so it was an escape from calcutta and its ambience so we enjoyed it enormously and many of these cousins were um, also interesting characters <laughs> uh, some of them became doctors like their parents as yes. some of them um, took to when there was one who even took to agriculture 
hmm. and has become basically an agriculturist hmm? Hmm. Uh, probably rebelling against uh, the family profession of medicine but you went to school in bhagalpur uh, briefly which this was... was because in calcutta there was this experience of japanese bombing hmm. there was you know, my father sent off us to bhagalpur to be away from calcutta because the japanese had reached up or almost up to kohima hmm. so there was always always the fear that they will uh, try to penetrate further they were already occupied on the one and the other islands hmm. but otherwise we were not touched by the experience over much though because or too much we were young and we were also exposed to the idea that whenever the siren rang we had to go down to the basement hide under the staircases mm. in case there is bombing but that's about all because it was more like a going visiting a resort on in holidays and your father was in medicine what was no, his he wasn't mm-hmm. he was by that time a secretary of calcutta yms Oh okay. he started life as a school teacher first in Nagpur okay where my two aunts were and then moved to Calcutta when he very really taught briefly in Scottish church school mm-hmm. but then he got this job with to which he stuck till the end of his life mm-hmm. in different branches of the YMCA YMCA mm-hmm. yeah. and uh, that opened up a new world for me mm-hmm. at least me and my brother too because the british was not yet born that i look um, back on that with some fondness because though we were a middle class family we had access to half a dozen libraries each of us my father presided over two branches of ymca so they both of them had their own libraries mm. and there was a library for the younger people mm. in, in one of the branches that also we had access to plus we were encourage to borrow books from our school libraries mm. and also to join the british council library and the university library in calcutta mm. so we had access to half a dozen libraries mm. and later on i even became a member as a very young person of the national library i still remember well known library and well known for his work for the library Mm. I remember the name of the assistant librarian who was my father's friend, uh, Mule. Mm. He was from Nagpur. That is why my father knew him. So when this, um, once we were visiting Mule, I remember uh, me and my brother um, both were there. And uh, Chief Librarian also was there. And he immediately said, let me give them a tour of the National Library. And I wouldn't forget that. Yeah, because we were very young, both of us. Mm. and he he spent so much time with us explaining the library and showing us around that major memory mm. for both of us this must be when you were in school so i was school i was probably in, uh, not more i know probably class 7 or 8 okay. and that kind of thing you know but somebody so well known uh, that was showing us around the library and introducing us to the uh, world of books itself very remarkable thing so which school did you go in calcutta calcutta i was first at st paul's okay and then shifted to sub- scottish church school okay and subsequently i also studied in scottish church college for my intermediate classes that then joined medical college my many of my friends were going there and my parents were happy because i have so many doctors in the family yeah so they were they, they liked it in fact that became a major source of i should say crisis to my parents when after three years of medical education i decided to give it up i had gone to my aunt's place my father's two sisters who worked in nagpur one of them was principal of a major school saint ursula school in nagpur and the other was principal of a bengali school in nagpur, nagpur had a large settlement of bengalis so she was there the, my aunts were not married and we were like their children and once i went there and i said that i don't want to study because i am very tired some and this is not my field now oh, i feel that it is so they tried to push me into engineering college give me a medicine if, or something more fruitful because this this was a disaster to them that somebody is leaving uh, medical college yeah. 
a college with the name medical college <laughs> he didn't know our name because it was the first medical college of asia established 1821 so man said that all, all right she was principal of a school i told you and i will talk to the principal of islam college and get you admission if you want to study you start from bachelor bachelor you have to study you won't get any credit for this intermediate thing so you start from scratch but doesn't matter that part of the problem was subsided to for for the moment and ultimately i did very well both in my bachelor's degree as well as my masters you studied in uh, nagpur nagpur <coughs> you masters both mm-hmm. graduate <coughs> what did you for study and ma for b i had if i remember correctly i had psychology uh, sociology and uh, i think I either political science or political or economics i i think it come one of the two i forget now but i did very well in fact i stood first in the university and got mm-hmm. a gold medal so that pleased my parents to no end <laughs> because uh, standing first in the university at that time mattered a lot because my second brother was even better he, he was fifth among oh, uh one and a half lakh students <laughs> of calcutta university taking the ba examination so he went to presidency college after that to study area and i also stood first in the ma and in the process i got a couple of gold medals which i now found out recently <laughs> it was in the some vault because there were gold medals but i found that it wasn't uh, uh, golden as i thought because when i went uh, yes, yes. a couple of years i go to see in this it was said because i found that they have become black absolutely the gold disappeared yeah. <laughs> gold disappeared <laughs> no. no but doesn't matter fact the matter was that this opened up a lot of scope for me and it is from there i went to amelbar during during those four years of my ba and ma reading because i was very curious to get exposed to the world of humanities and social sciences mm. and the university library gave me a full access and i got um, also a number of other advantages one i had studied sanskrit mm. at, in calcutta because it was compulsory but i never liked it, it too, <laughs> too much of grammar but here in the library i found excellent bilingual editions of some of the sanskrit classics mm. and uh, i read through the whole of mahabharata but even roy stan fashion of it okay uh, in both sanskrit and in english and also um, um, if i had difficulty because some of the terms were not accustomed to i was not accustomed to the advantage also was this that i could also get bengali translations there okay because calcutta in uh, nagpur university was affiliated to calcutta university earlier so that history helped me because the library was full of bengali books also okay uh, so sometimes uh-huh. i could also go back if i found it difficult to understand something in english mm. i could read it in bengali also in calcutta the culture youth culture was um, intellectual concerns but with fashionable intellectual concerns <laughs> so if you went to calcutta coffee house they will ask you first that uh, have you read satra <laughs> have, have you read uh, other kamu hmm. oh, or ts eliot yeah till eliot eliot was called uh, a conservative poet but nonetheless he was one of the first modern poets so okay. we have to read that so it's, i had read the 1970s and yeah, no 70s nice 19 i'm talking of 1950s oh i'm 84 <laughs> so in nagpur when i had peace i i could read some of these writers i was recommended to read with more ease and time and really enjoy them whereas previously i had to acquaint myself them with just to survive in uh, calcutta youth cultures so that so that's what the other part of the story i have read ts eliot at least three times in my life oh. once in calcutta once in nagpur and even later i re- again reread him uh, you know 
by that time I've learned, learned the subtleties of English language a little bit more and I enjoyed it much more because I knew that I had read them as a duty or as a, under pressure. But whereas now I was reading them for pleasure. Anyway, that was one of the things. And that opened a different intellectual world. That was the first time I tried to read um, some of the books recommended by the, like I read the Communist Manifesto in Calcutta, you know, and that was very impressive, very impressive. But I also felt that something was missing yeah, because it is, and now if, I, if you tell, ask me, I would use the word positivist Marxism, like, uh, as if uh, the world is moving on a, uh, on scientific basis and on the basis of scientific knowledge. And so you can explain everything by Marxist, positivist Marxist, that, that you know, it is like the way hard boiled um, uh, Marxists ah. by which you talk at that time. But I also read simultaneously Freud and opened a new world, human subjectivities. And for the first time, I knew that there is another world where even Marxism can be criticized for lacking something, a critical uh, view of critical um, a, a, a Freudian view. So I, that openness came in, you know, in my thing. Mm. It was, this helped me a lot when I went to the clinic because there I found an even better library uh, introduced me for the first time to psychoanalytic attempts to interpret human violence, wars, and so on and so forth, or even revolutions for that matter, which the earlier exposure to Marx seem, now seem to me to be thin, mm. that somehow it uh, uh, underestimated the human personality, the underestimated the uh, inner world, Mm -hmm. The some things you know, learned is, for example, that uh, people, if given a choice, will believe in what the thing is to be true, than what is really the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. So subjectivity is important, of some ways, mm -hmm. and also that your inner needs shape your view of the world. For instance, to give you just an example, journalism and patriotism. It's not a good distinction because patriotism is a word probably not chosen rightly by me. I was looking for another word but couldn't find easily so I ultimately used patriotism. Patriotism is normal and natural for ordinary human beings because territoriality is something which humans as a all other mammals have it. Most mammals, I won't say all, most mammals have it. In the sense that cats and dogs also have territoriality. Mm, yes. If you leave your house and change your house, your dog will grumble, go with you, grumble, and one, uh, once in a while go back to the old house. Mm. Mm. Cats are even more territorial. Yes. So if you go to another house, the cat will stay back in the old house and make friends with the new family mm. rather than going to the new house. And same thing with birds, many, many, many varieties of birds, because that's the way how the pigeon mail system came into being that that sick territorial thing. And so you can send messages, mm. you know where it will reach. So there was, that was that. That is the nature of territoriality. Your earliest memories are the decisive in patriotism is territoriality being based on territoriality is instinctive. That means everybody is patriotic unless something major traumatic happens there or not. Uh, patriotism is a biologically determined trait. Everybody is a patriot unless something traumatic has happened in his life. And that, that's rare. So, but in nationalism, it's not that. Ideologies always enter a person's personality only when he's youth, youth, when he reaches the youth. When from a child, he becomes a young man, young adolescent. 
So it, it, in your adolescence, you choose nationalism because you are you choose amongst ideologies and what you find compatible with you, what you find more comfortable with, you choose. Not only tells you what patriotism does, but it also tells tells you who your enemy will be and who are, that is also given to you. Mm. So it is ideological frame. Uh, it's a different kettle of fish. I understand. So, Some uh, of these things have also mm. come very strongly, analytically informed way in many of your writings. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, your reading of Tagore's nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, I am reminded of mm -hmm. that uh, comparative reading of Vivekanand, Tagore, Gandhi, mm -hmm. uh, in that nationalism work. So you had a critical understanding of Marx. Did you have similar kind of criticality toward Freud too, who you at some point of time also labeled savage Freud? You see, the um, whole Western li literature is also flawed by the Enlightenment values. The Enlightenment values look very nice, but I have gone through all the major writers and found that every one of them has smattering of racist terms, racist concepts, racist ideas. You know, unbelievably so. So even in case of Freudians, that they would equate childhood with uh, tribalism. Uh, no. So it, Cecil Rhodes, who, who talked about the Africans and half savage, half child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this is all over the place. Mm -hmm. Monks, page after page, you find this kind of thing. Mm. You find this in Jefferson, the great um, author of democracy. Mm. You find this in even um, Kant and Hegel. And so this all societies, this is all Darwinian uh, social evolutionism picked up lock, stock and barrel from biology and transport to human societies. So we are caught in that <coughs> even now, even now, everything became evolutionary. So there was for, for that matter, uh, evolution of societies from the primitive to the tribals and others, to, to, to the uh, capitalist to socialist to communism, that kind of thing. And this kind of uh, uh, management of history, so to speak, Mm. Uh, 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 I found not only childish but also vulgar and racist. Yeah. Mm. And therefore, there is a built-in check, check out. So there's a different kind of way of looking at the same thing. Mm. That uh, what seemed natural and normal and part of text mm. may, may not be that normal, and that that. It, you have a right to say so mm. and to write so. And I have, therefore, in some sense, I am free of the constraints of both Marxism and Sephardness as Freud. The mix, the mix of them is I'm more tolerant of because it that mix had something to offer, I felt. So that also is there in my, One good example is this, the Frankfurt School, mm. which was both Marxist, they were all Freudians, but many of them were Marxist. One or two were not exactly Marxist, but uh, yes, but uh, Eric Fromm, Marxist, Marxist Freudian. Uh, that's the The fate of Marxists and Freudians, both Marxists and Freudians were decimated by Nazis. Both. And the only book which survived is those who are both Freudian and Marxist. <laughs> because Horkheimer and Eric Fromm did a study of German workers mm. who were then predominantly divided between socialists and communists, trade mm. unions. So everybody was expecting the workers not to collaborate with the Nazis and thought Nazism to be a pa passing phase. But Horkheimer and Eric from study they convinced Horkheimer, he was then the director of Frankfurt School, mm. to let 
she has to, must take some safeguards. First thing he did was to shift the Institute of Social Studies or whatever it is, so, so, Frankfurt Institute, School of Social Studies. to near the station of Frankfurt. <laughs> and purchased a land and a build house on the Switzerland side, uh, where the, near the station there, uh, in, in Switzerland. And the day Nazis come, took over, the overnight shifted the whole institute from there to Switzerland. <laughs> they are the only group of Freudians and only group of Marxists who survived intact. In Ahmedabad, also, there is a lovely library, and that's where I discovered political psychology mm -hmm. and the necessary part of both political science and psychology. Necessary, and so no politics can be understood without human personality, human nature, and no human nature is complete without an understanding of politics. This is the logic. It, that is why uh, you also tend to uh, um, get inspired by various kind of local resources, textual, uh, absolute traditions yeah, no, of knowledge, textual and it's, also non-textual. Yeah, because this is a society where, in very major, there are huge domains of the society. Uh, I think whole of South Asia. When I talked about it, in, in, in India, I mostly by my South Asia. Hmm. All of South Asia, because that was a civilization and state, you know, thing. In, in this area, a huge domains are there, which are not textual. Hmm. Hmm. Not textual. Shruti, Gyan. Shruti and Smriti, both. Shruti. Yeah. Don't forget. Hmm. And Shruti and Smriti, my difference is this, the Shruti is revelatory often, but Smriti is not, not revelatory, but it is so you get even more freedom. Yes. The Shruti texts are sacred texts <laughs> and it doesn't give you that much of freedom, but the smart texts have a different kind of logic to it. I mean, who is going to read Sanskrit Ramayana if 300 versions of Ramayana are there, as Arjun says, and everybody has read some now, like Tulsidas or um, others, Ka Ka Kashiram Das and others, or so many people, you know, so, so many Ramans and so on too. So that opened my eyes to that part of the story. That, 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 and it, these are held in Smithy. That the best example, of course, is Indian music. India, since around independence to now onwards, more than 60 universities have departments of music. Mm -hmm where they teach give you degrees, BA, MA and PhD in music. So it has produced excellent music critics, excellent musicologists, excellent historians of music. But till now, not a single performing artist in last 80 years, 70 years, 75 years, not one, because I, I was thinking that there was an exception, Prabhatre, because she has a PhD in music and also performs. But when her 80th birthday, she was given a uh, reception here in Delhi and they asked her that, how did you come to this? He said, she said, one of the first things she said was this, that yes, uh, I was thinking of doing, do that, doing that and I thought this is degree, book is a nature like a, if I want to be a performing in art, I have to have a guru first. So she went and chose a guru and took training from her after PhD. So, because music is uncharted textually, it is you have to learn to smithy and keep it through smithy. And that is why some of the greatest, most influential parts in not only in music, but so many domains of life are through this Martha text. And sure. the medieval India, which many people following the West call it the Dark Ages. Mm. Indians also started saying they call it Dark Ages. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually the golden age of India. Because for the first time, you had this whole new school of 
Bhakti movement and Sufi movement. Samaritans, you cannot identify one from the other. Tagore was the first to notice this. And he was a Brahma. Brahma. Brahma movement, as you per know, is based on Vedas and Upanishads. The purity of Hinduism is in Vedas and Upanishads. So they thought that this purity, if they move that to purity, they can reform Hinduism. And that was a Brahma. He remained Brahma all his life. But nonetheless, he was the first to say that we are not this India, what you see around the unity, sense of unity, whatever, whatever perfects the humanity is not a product of Vedas and Upanishads, is a product of the medieval India, medieval India. We are the inheritors of the medieval India because it, it is that India mm. that has given us this unity and disowning it, the heartthrob of India, heartthrob of India, that's what India heart beats. You will not find it in a text, but in the Smritis. Right. That's the strength of that. So when Gandhi came, he intuitively sensed this. And before he came, I've just now written a postscript for a collection of my writings on Gandhi. Mm. With Tiji Suri's editing and uh, Vinay Lal will write the introduction. Mm. And where I say that I found out a very brief article by a Bengali writer who writing five years after Tagore's death finds in Tagore writings of 1880s, 1880s, when, as early as that, that in these writings, two plays and a number of books, poems, that Tagore is uh, predicting the emergence of a leader who will be like Gandhi. When nobody knew Gandhi, Gandhi was just a briefless um, advocate brief, uh, in South, South Africa. Mm. Not even started the book of life there, South Africa. Mm. And nobody has heard of him. Tagore almost unwittingly dis disguised characters and, and expects a liberation come, coming to a liberator who has all the features of Tagore, Gandhi. Mm. Because, and he compares it with the case of Krishna and Ram, mm. that both Ram and Krishna were worshipped much before Ramayana was written and much before Krishna Vipan or Bhagavata was written. Much before that. The worship was there and there, and there was this picture of Ram and Krishna in the hearts of people. And that with the when Vyasa wrote or others wrote, uh, Ramayana, other Mahavaras and so on and so forth. Then they built, built on that in the people's memories. Mm. That's why Mahavarata could be written over a period of 800 years or so. Mm. Hmm? Yeah. And, and, and this Gandhi came without Tagore consciously trying to sell that idea. You know, it is just fantastic. Because a poet's intuition in this case is, is, is the poet's intuition. It's, it's, it's fantastic. And one particular example he gives is uh, lovely that, that he writes it because he and his father went to Amritsar to spend the Sikh divines and the sons and all that, you know, they were deeply moved by the music as well as the way of rituals and so on and so forth. And he wrote a, after that a long poem on Guru Gobind Singh. Mm. Now, Guru Gobind Singh, everybody knows, is mm. a warrior saint. But he begins like that, Tevor. But after a while, he changes his, his tone without knowing. That same poem changes and thinks of uh, Gobind Singh in terms of Gandhi. He looks like a second Gandhi. <laughs> <laughs> the, you know, you know so. Mm. so, that is, you see. So, Gandhi also was a product of that. It was stayed in the minds of people, mm. stayed in the minds of people. And it was a construction of the mind of the people because Tagore tapped onto that because he could, somehow poet's intuition allowed him to do so. Mm. And uh, I've spelt out mm. the five key sources mm. of culture and what Tagore, where Tagore picked it up from 
the culture or culture picked it up from the Tagore, whatever it is. Tagore textualized it so it leads more people. Mm. And more. But this is the way it came, that it was not accidental, Gandhi's thing. It is civilizational values. Mm. Uh, in fact, I write in my thing that whenever there is a, I mean, when uh, during emergency, they have suddenly, out of nowhere, people started working on Gandhi. Hmm. And there were a surfeit of books, a whole bloody lot of books on Gandhi, good, bad, indifferent, but everybody was writing on Gandhi. You know, many people who have never talked of Gandhi ever, overnight became Gandhians, including some of the major Marxist things. The RCPI, Panalab Dasgupta was a revolutionary. He once took over the Dhamna airport. Veena Das, who tried to shoot the governor in Bengal, revolutionary. It was my, my wife, my mother's, my mother's contemporary. So he, she became a Gandhian, Congress side. Hmm. You want Congress? You know, this helped. But in any case, this is the thing that when it done, so much so that now that there is a spurt of the writings from Gandhi, the whole bloody spurt of Gandhi, I feel like reversing the process. That whenever you see a lot of people taking interest in Gandhi, it indicates that there is something people have sensed about an attack on their civilizational values. Mm. No? So there is that, that part of the story. That part of the story. So my attitude of Gandhi over time changed mm. dramatically. A change when I was writing Intimate Enemy, he mm. is a hero and, uh, uh, and I uh, recognize that, mm. that I did without knowing that I had done it. I didn't be much self-conscious. For example, that androgynous self, I mean, if you would have on by his abuse of uh, Bidhrism as demasculinizing Indian or Bhukim Chandra's attempt to turn Krishna into a Semitic Godhead, all perfect, all knowing, omnipresent. The three characteristics of Godhead are this Islam, Judaism, Islam, Judaism, and Christianity shares, mm. both Catholics and Protestants. Well, they share the belief that God has to be omnipresent, omniscient, omniscient, omnipresent. Because on the time to rewrite Krishna, mm. they don't have that, uh, uh, that sensibility to guess that this is a work of a civilization by this Mahabharata. Mm. It, 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 it is not the work of individual writers mm. that you will say that such and such means most most ka my baat bhus gaya hai, is ka bhi baat bhus gaya hai. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. those are all uh, avoidable. So you cannot say that. Gandhi reaffirmed the androgynous self of India. Abdul is not an accidental thing. It is only the pers personification of a Godhead, which is simultaneously masculine and feminine. In fact, the most powerful, most powerful deities are the women deities. Without this, the whole of Gujarat is supposed to, most of Gujarat is Vaishnava. Mm. But when it comes to serious illness, or somebody is dying and they want to pray, they don't go to Krishna Mons. Yes, Kali Temple. Kali Temple. Oh, right in uh, central Ahmedabad. Mm. Because that's the most powerful goddess. Even the British, who first hundred years of the British rule, nearly hundred years, less than hundred years, uh, when the Suraj Canal was not built, so they couldn't bring their wives or one marry and come back. Yes. Because it took six months to go yes. around the Cape of Buto, South Africa. Yeah. So at that time, uh, used to bang, marry Bengali women, yeah. Bengali, a little bit Biharis, Assamese, Asmogu, that, that area, Bengal, Bihar, Assam, Odisha. So I found some diaries, I said some diaries, accidentally, where the men go to church on Sundays, but also keep a retainer, they gave this English, marrying Indians, they keep a retainer, Brahmin, will come and do puja. And also, send a chadu to Dharga. The, because the presiding deities of smallpox, Sitala, of 
cholera, Olai Bibi and Olai Chandi. Olai Chandi for Hindus, Olai Bibi for Muslims. Karam, Shashti, Rahma Shashti, or child, children's wonders. These were the privileged goddesses. Because they protected your children. So even for the British, that was an important thing no, because they wanted a, a touch. So they, 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 there is this part of the story too. Yes. Uh, so from there, I mean, I understand uh, I mean, the, the corpus of knowledge that is associated with you is very vast. And if one tries to take note of each bit of it, probably it will take few days. So I will uh, uh, cut it short, uh, that part, and then come to another part, which is also strongly related to you. Though it has not uh, come out in written form, mm. but uh, you are also known as a fiercely independent mind. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, probably you developed a critical understanding of both Marx and Freud, mm. two very strong presiding deities, theoretical deities of mm. Western theoretical thinking. Mm. Uh, this was precisely to, to do with your independent uh, intellectual inquiries. So how do you look at your, this particular side of your personality? Because I have is... kept my eyes and ear open. Because I have kept my eyes and ear open. I have some developed a deep respect for the ordinary people. I do believe that people can be misled. This can be, but I'm also convinced that they cannot be, you can fool some people for some bias. <laughs> Not all people for all time, all time. The same goes. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, um, and that is an important thing, first, first and foremost. And I also, in a suspicion that intuitively people do sense what is right or what is not right in some ways. They might be, you know, uh, taken in by the other things because present regime has blurred the line between Hinduism and Hindu. Savarkar didn't, don't forget. Savarkar was that out and out rationalist. He was an atheist and a rationalist. And he did believe that India must have a nation. The only people whom can make a proper nation are the Hindus because they are the majority. That was his fault. So here Hindus are only instruments and Hindutva has nothing to do with Hinduism. Yeah, these words, mm. he says these words. Now they have twisted it. I mean, even now there is resistance to that also. I and mean, one of our surveys shows that only in one state, believing in Hinduism fully, be a devout Hindu has a direct correlation with also believing in Hindutva. Only one step. Which state it is? What will you make a guess? Hmm? Gujarat. I, I had in my mind. Uh, only one step. Baki sabme, everybody understands the difference between the two. People are not fools. Gujarat is bombarded by that. Bombarded by. Uh, now, it's, it's, it's the whole media war is a, is a very important war. You know, it. it, it it touches everybody and there's a take full advantage of that. The movies, it, it is said that Modi's advisors are those who are advisors to um, the American politicians too. Uh, it's very famous. And, uh, I, I remember, don't remember the name now, but it's, uh, the NRI is probably found that for it. That so propaganda can do many things, mm. but sometime or other it is bound to be ignored or sidetracked by others. I remember you also said that for intellectual independence is necessary to be in the margin. You were trying to highlight the importance of marginality. And not only for that, mm -hmm. it is one of the, one of the predictors of creativity because you are coming from outside. You are under socialized in your discipline. Freud was not a psychologist. Mm -hmm. He was a doctor and a physiologist, but he turned a psychologist and he has opened up a whole world. Right. Mm. Marx was not an economist. The economic determinism was there, but in his work, 
but he was not an economist he was a philosopher so let's see in psychology in my discipline the eight major subsections all have been been uh, pioneered by persons who are not psychologists <laughs> somebody was an engineer somebody was a statistician no no so hota hai utra marginality rahe na se you are in, you are bringing a new fresh perspective mm. and you can see it from little bit outside that mm. all the all the while you can ask questions which others don't dare ask right because it will look like blasphemy <laughs> yeah but in that marginal space one also needs plenty of sufficient amount of inner strength uh, yes that that was probably true but that way i was lucky that i was in this center and people like rajni and others thought that uh, political science required a new perspective and uh, encouraged me in what i was doing fully that no problem and um, i i didn't have to look outside i my critics were right here if they passed it i felt like i'm happy rajni thirubai said giri deshinkar this three definitely you have to see it with the third eye that's the, that's the you know, th- third eye or, or third ear if you like hmm. lastly i mean from my side uh, though there cannot be an end to a conversation with you there's so much i mean i am still bubbling with a lot of uh, questions but i'll rest, uh, restrict myself to this last bit uh, which is about um, you must have uh, been observing the younger academics like myself and the kind of university system that we are into right now mm. the larger culture of mm. academic politics mm. all of us are in rat race of some kind yes i don't we do not know where we are headed so what is your critical understanding of uh, this time of you know so some of these things are a matter of lonely search you have to prepare for that loneliness for a very long time and uh, i am accustomed to that so it's difficult for me to say this answer this question because uh, i don't want to sound heroic uh, because many people do also do it without a sense of being heroic or whatever because intuitively they make sense what is what i would say that it is a self imposed isolation too and i i cannot fight on all fronts so i therefore do not see social media at all <laughs> my brother says that acha kya tum ko gali milta hai to gali dete ho so you will be disoriented while like to answer and all that you know uh, i don't want to get into that but um and um, so and i'm also aware of my age that now it is time i should say what i have to say yeah, irrespective of what people like or dislike i think people have a sense of that somehow that it is that many 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 serious thinkers and scholars are deeply perturbed about that that here is a hinduism as a philosophy way of life mm. and something which has given sustenance intellectual sustenance to very large part of it when it is i mean one pakistani scholar was in, in, interviewed by ndtv once and he said no, but we are not arab we are not arab we are muslims despite pakistan staying sitting in lahore we are not arab muslims we are hindu muslims <laughs> they, they got it even the pakistan television also got it because <laughs> right so that that is there mm-hmm. and also this is a society where another great civilization has an influence and that is the persianate culture mm-hmm. that is understated and under now some scholars are working on that mm-hmm. and people forget that uh, uh, or don't forget they often deliberately suppress the fact that uh, shivaji's official language was persian yeah parsi and 
that because that also is a civilization and india has exchanged now had a lot to exchange now this kind of letter for all kinds of civilizations i mean we have a huge in, uh, impact of on us on the tibetan things many of the texts of for, formal texts of in, in hinduism are in tibet and to spite india china has given the first right to an austrian group <laughs> to get get access to them first for the they get uh, they are india specialists in austria okay so they will get the intellectual credit for this deciphering those texts and so on so for just to show that this gentleman with india mm -hmm. done it but doesn't matter the we have that exchange so cynic civilization is a continuity we have yeah. i mean what is after all ladak what is after all mizoram no so you do not uh, i mean you must be you're talking to us all the time you must be getting some sense what is happening in academics what kind of academic politics is prevalent today uh, it's not even politics you know it's a very petty kind of thing you know, ambedkar university was one of the most innovative universities in india true to the name of ambedkar it should have been now they have imposed a woman who has come from a technological school did ambedkar at that time didn't even have a single science fit that department but he she came and now introduced something of science and all because this government understand that similarly the number of uh, 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 departments just started suddenly that strategic studies and defense studies and so on and so forth right? the most of the studies are absolutely bogus because india doesn't have the capacity of that kind of manpower to have this kind of hmm. uh, Uh, so many issues of this kind, and they're multiplying like mushrooms because everybody knows that if you take a certain department like that, they will flood it by funds. Mm. So it's, it's a pathetic situation mm. because they don't want to social sciences, they don't want humanities. So it's, it's a Singapore model. Ah, Singapore. Mm -hmm. Singapore has been trying desperately for the last thirty years. to become one of the top most in 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 the city in the world and every time they find that they are not missing it both because you have first class scientists a first class technologists first class doctors but you don't have first class humanities and social sciences any university is to be called a university must have a department of philosophy must have a department of mathematics okay to just end my part of conversation uh, uh, may i take you back to something something very interesting you observed and that was about the excess of maternal affection coming from not only your mother your aunts uh -huh. do you think uh, that maternal affection uh, uh -huh. plays out very important role in the you know shaping up of the mind personality of a scholar yes. that also gives you immense strength to stay lonely and look at things yes, differently you, you, you're right and i i i recognize that i certainly recognize that and i would like to emphasize that part of the story further because hmm, i think and many people ask me do you ever feel embarrassed or uh, guilty about anything one of my sense of guilt is this that mom, when my elder aunt died of ca cancer i couldn't go and see her because i had i had my work there in amedabad then so i couldn't just leave it and go because at that time uh, uh, i was finishing something you know and now i feel that uh, i should have somehow or managed to go nonetheless even if for one day just to see her I feel very guilty. That guilty. But yes, you are very right. That that maternal. I see the same thing in Kumar Sanu. By the way, <coughs> life. I have just tried, but writing a trying to write a chapter mm. on Kumar Sanu. What I have. Ananda Kumar Sanu. Uh, mm. uh, because I am um, going to do a thing or something of possibility. Mm. Kumar Sanu was one who 
suddenly opened up Asian arts for the West and broadened our concept of modernism and self-confidence to us mm. to pursue art in a different kind of way. Mm. So, and he had the same thing. He was brought up by his mother, her sister, and her mother's mother. <laughs> that is quite a good uh, Freudian clue uh -huh. to go back. That is time. probably true. Freud himself said once, no, no, nobody gets uh, becomes great un until and unless the mother. He, his mother mm. or her mother uh, did not think he will be great. Mm.